Yes, I. Greeting once again, not the mighty name of his imperial majesty, Emperor the Selassie the first, and all things that's good. You see, you don't know. Welcome all viewers and subscribers. No respect, you know, see. Viewers, if you like the content, man, just subscribe and grow the thing, you know, see it, and, and, and spread the word. I don't know. I always effort this as a youth, you know, you know, see it, and we have to start somewhere. And all the subscribers, them give thanks to the support and the encouragement. You know, see it, make it well worthwhile, priceless. You know, see it. Mm -hmm. So we are continuing with the reading from the book. You know, see, we are continuing with the series. See, past history of Jamaica. I know a whole lot of people ask so you can get the book. The book is on Amazon for sale, man. It's named Born for Dead by Larry Guns. Larry Guns. L A U R I E G U N S T. See, so, we are the fourth chapter now, named End Game. See, so we could continue with the reading. See? Dixie's emerald and ruby inlay glinted in the lamplight when he smiled. When he smiled, he was in a good mood this night. Settled on Bramble's veranda to reason about the 70s and his days as the Tel Aviv passive top ranking. It was a Saturday night and King Chubby, Central's best DJ, had set up a pair of booming speakers and super stud corner for a street dance that would go on until dawn. The sound system was pounding through the neighborhood with dance hall tunes by Super Cat and Ninja, hailing the rule of the dance. And they were no longer just dance. No, they were dance goddess, veritable gods of the street. Brambles pointed out the girls from the protein posse, the local queens who had so named their crew because they were eating well. Know that their boyfriends, boops, and foreign, a foreign were sending down money from crack sales in Miami and New York. Them nice up themselves for the dance, Brambles said approvingly. Then he looked at me in my habitual khaki shorts and limp cotton shirt, damped with sweat. He sucked his teeth in, in affectionately, in affectionate contempt. I never see an American daughter just like you. <laughs> Why you not put on something, Chris? <laughs> you all the time look like you're some kind of war correspondent. She's all right, Dixie. Dixie preferred. Dixie preferred. She just for work. Gunshots rang out from the corner and we all thronged to the sharp top yards wall to see what was happening. The super stud crowd was running up faster lane with police jeeps in hot pursuit. Bramble's daughter Natalie burst in through the gate laughing and panting. Boy toss a firecracker right under the police car, she gasped. Every one of his scatter. Chubby well vexed, but his speaker was still cranked up to the max. And soon everyone was back on the corner as if nothing had happened. We get to see we don't, we get we get we get so we don't even run from gunfire now brambles said mournfully we run to see what happened dixie wiped the heads of sweat the beads of sweat dixie wiped the beads of sweating condensation from his red stripe and began to drink melding his own biography into the days when manley was prime minister and the power of the the gangs reached its crescendo. He had been a major player on the passive stage, and he looked back to his performance with a mixture of sorrow and nostalgia. Before there was Tel Aviv, he said, well before Michael Manley's time, the big massive here in Central was the Max Gang, and that was my tribe. Massive is just another word for a gang. Well, I did some time just at the end of the 60s in the general penitentiary over there in Reto and while I was in I lost I, I kind of lost touch with the runnings on the street 
there was a tailor we call liniments and foster lane a guy who dressed sharp and got some ranks behind him when i came out liniment was controlling things with the max according to brambles the word on the neighborhood vine was that the, that dixie had bowed and become a batty man a homosexual in the general penitentiary and that this was why the youths from the max had turned against him but he recouped his former status by killing the man who'd started the Batman rumor. Another Max member named Buckles. Dixie and Laminant resolved their difference and together they forgot the new gang. And together they forged the new gang they called Tel Aviv. That was around the time when the PMP won its first general election since, since independence. In 1972, and Michael Manley became Prime Minister. Central was his constituency, and his victory meant that the neighborhood was finally going to get some housing and development projects. It also meant that Central's posse would start lining up for their share of this patronage gravy. There was already ominous signals that the gangs were calling the shots downtown after testing their power during the West Kingston riots. The JLP Phoenix and the PNP Spanglers had begun colonizing other sections of the city. Now that Manly and the PNP were in power, it was clear that the PNP's garrisons were going to carry superior force. I can still remember the day when Michael came down here campaigning just before the 72 election, Bramble said. He was set to speak at a at a rally right there on East Queen Street at the football field where you and I met that first day. He was so proud and happy like this was his own constituency. After all, he didn't expect any trouble here. Well, the man walked straight into a three-way gunfight between the old Max, Tel Aviv and the Skull. The Skulls was one of them little JLP cadres that the Phoenix from West was infiltrating Central Kingston with and it was based up on the last street corner. He shook his head sadly and Dixie nodded in agreement. We, we was all trying to demonstrate our power that day, Dixie said. It come in like we knew Manly would be the next prime minister. So we was all trying to muster ranks and show him who ruled down here. When the shots started fire, I went over the chain link fence with everyone else, Bramble said. Everyone have run from the guns, but I was there to take pictures, so I was close enough to Manly, to Michael, to see his face, and I will never forget that. Was like he never really believed what him see. After, after Manly won, the PNP started pouring money and talent into his constituency, sending some of the party's most progressive men into Central to organize youth groups, sports clubs, and community development projects. Party member Arnold Bertram worked out a monetary truce between Tel Aviv, the Max, and the Skulls, whose members were wiring in the neighborhood. A tall, a lanky man whose dark face wreathed, with, wreathed quickly into a smile, Bertram had an engaging manner that was part sufferer and part canny politician. Soon after he brought Central's three gang to the peace table, the PNP made him Minister of Information and Culture. By 1973, things were quieter in the constituencies and the tribal warriors were thinking more along the lines of football clubs and youth groups than guns. But the Skulls gang was still Central's, Central's loose cannon, taking orders from the Phoenix in West Kingston. Its leader were two brothers, Ruddy, and Rocky Nesbet. Rodi and Rocky Nesbet and the ties between them and Siaga's labor right gunmen were tight. There was always too much tension, Dixie said. Too many dogs, not enough bones, you see. Man was already getting into socialism and it seemed like everyone got politicized all of a sudden. So Tel Aviv got bigger even after we start call ourselves socialist. The youth them like that position, but Roddy and Radai and the rest of the skulls got vexed with the situation and just
pulled away, they felt like they was left out of the action and there was more to be had. Guns and such from the brothers over in Tivoli Gardens. Them man there didn't want no peace. In the bad man business, peace is besides the point. How is youth and you going to set themselves up? Distinguish themselves in a their era without violence. The gangs in Central Kingston were crucial to the PNP's ability to control its territory here, there. But the West Kingston passes had the greatest firepower and ranks because the sprawling slums and shanty towns of the city's west had long been prime, spr spr prime spawning grounds for outlaws. Spanglers and the Phoenix had been contending for jobs and patronage in the West since the mid 60s, but the Spanglers, along with other West Kingston's gang, loosely allied with the PNP, did not really become part of the political equation until their party came to power. When that happened in 1972, West Kingston's gang geographically, geography underwent a change as well. As all of the other passes began lining up behind the, the, the ruling PNP, Tivoli Gardens became the only real bastion of GLP gun power in the area. By the mid 1970s, one paladin had emerged in the PNP's concrete jungle as the area leader, a top ranking tribalist named Red Tony Welch. His patron was Anthony Spalding, the Minister of Housing for the PNP. Jungle. Jungle, as Red Tony's domain was usually called, had been a hotbed of gang activity for a long time. The neighborhood lies north of Tivoli on the other side of Mapen Cemetery and a ghetto known as Denham Town. Jungle and Tivoli had been fighting each other over politics for years. To make things even worse, Jungle backed up against another shanty town called Rima. The two armed camp faced each other across a no man's land that ran along 7th Street. By the mid 1970s, 7th Street had become one of West Kingston's worst war zones. The enmity between Jungle and Rima stemmed from the usual causes, but it deepened after money came to power because of the patronage lavish and concrete jungle. The sufferers of Rima had no patrons. They had been stepchildren of the JLP ever since Siaga bulldozed back a wall and hundreds of its displaced squatters fled to Rima for refuge but Siaga funneled all of the money and jobs into Tivoli and the people of Rima had nothing. Now they were trapped along the firing line between West Kingston's two most deadly political passes, the Tivoli's and Welsh's concrete jungle gang. All but invisible now that Welsh enjoyed the protection of Anthony Spardin. Red Tony Welsh was the don of Concrete Jungle, the gangster diplomat who dealt with Spardin and got jobs for the junglites and work sites all over town. You see, Dixie explained, when you is a sufferer, you can't really deal on a level with a big man like your local member of parliament. You must have a representative to deal with the MP. And Tony Welsh, meanwhile, and Tony Welch, meanwhile, started to make a name for himself, doing battle with Rima and Tivoli, and pretty soon he got into position, got the ranks behind him. So when Anthony Spalding needed a job done, like the fire bombing of the tenement yards on Orange Street, <laughs> Tony Welch obliged. But even with Welch dominance in concrete jungle, the neighborhood still spawned a string of other smaller gangs. They sprang from the corners named for their toughness. Texas, Angola, Mexico, and each had its own little armed squadron. As Dixie said, too many dogs, not enough bone, as they attached themselves like brambles to the politician. Downtown Kingston became, in the words of one PNP leader, a geography of violence. This violence got worse as Manly and Siaga hardened the lines between their two parties. After 1974, when Manly declared socialism as the platform of the PNP, Siaga went on the war path. He declared the JLP as a right-wing, freedom-fighting opposition, stonewalling Manly at every turn. And the paladins 
in turn took their cue from the big men uptown. Now the PNP shooters started seeing themselves as Cuban style revolutionaries and the JLP's gunmen thought they were fighting to save Jamaica from communism. Their gang signals were superficially funny. Labour rights youth refused to drink red stripe beer because red was a communist colour. PMP sufferers wouldn't touch Heineken beer because it came in a green bottle and green was the colour of the JLP. But some of them died because they ordered the wrong beer in the wrong neighbourhood or because they under thinking it went to a dance on the other side of town. <laughs> so, you know, yo, John, know them days are star. Mm -hmm. Michael Manley lamented the theatrical but deadly em enmities that was splitting the sufferers and turning Kingston into a battleground. Like his father, he recoiled from violence. He had hoped to mobilize Jamaica into a conscious vanguard for a change. And that now the power of the gang mocked all of his best intention. But Manley himself was often obliged to rely on the gunmen for protection when he went into sections of the city where he would have been defenseless without their guns. Many people told me that Winston Bury Boy Blake, one of PNP's most notorious enforcers, had saved the lives of Manley and his wife Beverly when a JLP gunman shot at them and Bury Boy threw them to the ground covering their bodies with his own. That was the reason, they said, why Manley made the, the decision to pay homage to the enforcer by attending his funeral in 1975. Even more frightening was the fact that Manley seemed unable to reign in his own ministers. There was no stopping warlords like Anton Spalding and other party members like Dudley Thompson and D.K. Duncan were equally besotted with the street power they got from their affiliation with gunmen. Such ties were a badge of honor in the ghettos, the way a politician earned respect. There was another side to this courtship, however, the bitter end game that inevitably played out when a gunman got too big and finally challenged a politician himself for supremacy. At that point, the big man quietly ordered the police to lock up the uppity mercenary or gun him down. If he lived, the gunman went to prison where outlaws from both parties got to know one another and began to see the folly of shedding each other's blood for the politician. Men like Tony Welch and Bucky Marshall and other shooters from the PNP would find themselves periodically cooling off in the general penitentiary with JLP rankings like Claudia Massop and Bayer Mitchell or they would be thrown together in gun court. The dreaded detention centre in Kingston South Camp Road where those accused of gun crime went to rot. There they sweared out the days and months, crammed into reeky cells, too small to lie down in, eating from the same slap bucket and being beaten with catonine tails by the same sadistic warriors. Even though they came from the opposite side of the political fence, jail taught them their community, the commonality. This was a lesson with serious repercussion, as the politicians later found out. Claudia Massop, Siaga's in force left Jamaica in 1972 for a long stint in England after Michael Manley and the PNP came to power, and Massop's fortunes at home were therefore less secure. When he returned in 1977, he was still done in Tivoli, and he even began thinking about running for some kind of political office. There was an ugly confrontation between Massop and Siaga himself when Massop accused his patron of being a warlord who cared nothing for the sufferers. Massop's own awakening was mirrored in the prison and street experiences of other gunmen. Many of them were then beginning to shift on easy to shift uneasily within the confines of their own political alliances the hard lines between jail pnp and the jlp was too constraining so some of the rankings were teaming up for bank work robberies and ganja dealing cloudy massop had a lieutenant in tivoli named Baya mitchell and Baya began hanging out with pnp gunmen from warikail and concrete jungle Copper. Copper 
the Robin Hood renegade from Warwick Isle had a girlfriend in Tivoli and was often seen there in the company of Massop and Mitchell, his former enemies. Meanwhile, Bucky Marshall, the PNP shootist, was in jail, having killed a popular youth from Concrete Jungle. The victim was a protege of another jungle gunman, Anthony Starkey Tingle, and although Starkey was PNP, he too had made some friends on the other side of the fence. When Marshall heard that Claude Massop was back from England and that he just might be persuaded by Starkey to take revenge for the slaying Marshall had done, the jailed gunman started fearing for his own life after he came out. He began making overtures to Massop's forces through the grapevine that ran from the general penitentiary to the streets. By the time the rankings downtown force field was exerting a gravitational pull beyond the ghettos, they had become authentic cultural voices for an entire nation of sufferers, and their outlaw exploit was the stuff of myth. Everyone knew they were powerful and dangerous, so were the politicians, but the politician would never belong to the sufferers, true tribe. Reggae stars like Bob Marley and Peter Touch came from the same root as the outlaws, and even though the singers had risen to international fame, they kept their old ties to the ghettos and the ghettos that had birthed them and their music. Although Manley had moved from uptown from his own Although, Man, although Marley had moved far uptown from his old trench town haunts into a breezy great house in Hope Road, formerly owned by Island Records magnet Chris Blackwell, he was still close with Claudia Massop and Bucky Marshall, burning many a spliff with Massop in the, in the Hope Road yard and scamming to fix the occasional horse race that came on a spark. But the alliance between the reggae superstar and his old friend in the underworld could turn deadly in a heartbeat. When someone shot Manley in his yard just before the 1970s election, Kingston buzzed with rumor that the CIA was behind the attack. But some said he'd been set up by the Tivalis after a racetrack scam went sour. It seems as if the rule of the gunman was just another feature of Jamaica's downhill slide. By 1977, Manley was losing ground in a series of small disasters, protracted and ultimately failed negotiation with the International Monetary Fund, a friendly, a friendship with Fidel Castro that had settled many Jamaicans over prickly where Cuba was, where Cuba was concerned and alienated the United States, an entrenched establishment that was turning against him and an opposition led by Siaga that was obviously arming itself to the teeth. A rising panic sweep swept through Kingston as Michael Manley and Kingston and Jamaica's experiment in democratic socialism both began to run on, em on empty. The sufferers in central Kingston felt the pressure drop and some of them were the ones who would soon pay for their political anxieties with their lives. In late 1977, a little cabal of rogue officers from the Jamaica Defence Force, loyal to Manley and, and convinced that the police force was in Siaga's pocket, hatched a plot to destroy the JLP's passes in Southside. The labour rights skull crew, there was still mass behind the Nesbitt brothers and Last Street. The passes youth had ingratiated themselves with a formidable Franciscan nun, Sister Benedict, who ran the Holy Family School in Southside. Sister, as everyone called her, had been living in the ghetto long enough to know the wisdom of keeping cool runnings in her area. And she pacified the ever restless call men by giving them occasional work at Holy Family. In return, they guarded the school and the last street training center next door but that was hardly a, a, a steady source of revenue instead they turned from money to the housing project the pmp had started building they turned for money to the housing project that pmp had started building a few blocks away on barry street but the work grounded to a halt because the skull kept fighting with other ranking over who got 
work on the site. This dire struggle was an affront to the PNP's ability to control its neighborhood, and the police was there, were there. And the police were doing nothing about it. So the army began putting some of its men into the field. One of them was Major Ian Robinson, a gunslinger who liked showing the police how to do their job. He was a small man, recalled Gleaner journalist David DeCosta, quite fearless and much valued by the army to engage in shootout. There were instances where police had criminals holed up in some part of Kingston and there was so much gunfire that they were hesitant to go in. Then Robinson would show up with his six guns blazing and at great personal risk go in and shoot to death three or four men that would put down the uprising. Robinson knew that the Skulls was a thorn in the PNP's side. To infiltrate the labor rights squadron in Southside and eradicate it once and for all, Robinson began to assemble an odd cast of characters from the Army's Military Intelligence Unit, MIU. The MIU Captain Carl Marsh was put in charge of the eradication squad, working under a shadowy Cuban advisor known only as Monterey, a man who disappeared later on. The infiltrator was a Southside youth named Junior Soul Douglas, who started hanging around the construction site on Barry Street just before Christmas 1977, the time of year when the sufferers are especially desperate for money and putting out the word that the army needed men with guns to guard the work site. The news spread to Southside like lightning and young men started jockeying for their chance to get the guns. Then the army put in Meta Harry to work, a lieutenant named Susanna Hick who lured a dozen Southside Leroyd store hotel where she received them in a film, filmy nightgown and promised that they'd soon get their weapons along with $300 for their guard work. For their guard work. Everything was ready for the massacre that followed. On the night of January 4, Juno Soul went into Southside with drivers of two vehicles and phone. Roddy Nesbitt, along with nine other suspected gang members. He told the men that soldiers were waiting out at Green Bay, an army firing range west of Kingston, to give them the, prop the promised guns. The Southies were suspicious at first, but decided to go ahead with the plan, and a little caravan left Southside for Green Bay. It was still dark when they got there. Soldiers met the crew and escorted them down to some targets set up in the sand by the water's edge. They told the men to bunch up and before the victims knew what was happening, a dozen hidden machine guns opened fire on them. Ruddy Nesbeth had, had already gotten down in the sand and now he started crawling for his life toward the dense Macathorn bush. But surround, that surrounded the, go, the cove. He heard his friends dying as he crawled. Glenroy Richard, Southside's, Southside's champion soccer player, cried for his girlfriend as he bled to death in the sand. Valerie, Valerie, Roddy heard his, him moan. I tell you, I never want to go, and no, I did. Five of the ten intended victims were killed outright. Ruddy and four other miraculously escaped. Norman Spencer, one of the survivors, heard his friend Ian Brown call out his name and beg for him to wait. As the two of them crawled through the sand, another survivor, Anthony Daly, caught up with them. I'm an I gone, Daly said Laconic laconically. The soldiers had shot out one of his eyes. Delroy Griffiths, the last survivor, made it to the water's edge and swam out to sea. He was rescued by a fisherman. By then the sun was up and the dead squad had radioed back to headquarters at Oak Park Camp with the bad news that five men had escaped. Soldiers were immediately dispatched to Southside to hunt down survivors and execute them. They were told to look for men with cuts and scrapes on their skins, but Ruddy Nesbeth outwitted the MIU. He led the wounded survivors straight to the Holy Family School where Sister Benedict hid them and then called the police. They were glad for the chance to embarrass their army rivals.
and they took the survivors into protective custody. Out at Green Bay, Major Ian Robinson was taking pictures of the five bodies sprawled in the sun. He was still sure the survivors would be found and killed, and then he would give out the Army's official story. The soldiers posted to the firing range for a target practice had been ambushed by the Southside gunmen and had fired back in self-defense. Robinson's photograph showed the long shadows of three soldiers standing over the dead men. He took the pictures back to Opar camp and, in the excitement of the moment, left them on his desk. Someone brought them to David de Costa, the gleaner. I didn't know quite what to do with them, de Costa said. The army's story was that the shootout had taken place at midday, but the pictures of the dead men clearly showed the soldiers long shadows. That meant they could only have been taken in the morning or the afternoon. And by the afternoon, the story was already out. So we knew it had to have been in the morning. And slowly, the army story began to unravel. An inquest into the Green Bay Massacre began two months later, although the jury eventually reached a verdict that unspecified persons were criminally responsible for the slaying no one from the army was ever sent to prison. Criminal charges were brought against eight soldiers. One was freed for lack of evidence in 1981, and the re remaining seven defendants were released a year later. After the government entered a plea of null prosecry, null, null prosecry, most of the officers involved in the plot left Jamaica for another island in the Caribbean. A few went to the United States. Manly's responsibility for what came to be known as the Green Bay Massacre remain an open question. There are those who think it was carried out on his orders. Others, say, others see it as Siaga's brainchild. Even though the victims were labor rights, Siaga would not have barked at sacrificing a few expendable sufferers in order to smear the PNP. Brambles knew all five Green Bay survivors. Most of them were still in Southside, living and partly living. Living and partly living. Delroy Griffith was a crackhead, prancing through the street like a puppet on wires and begging anyone for her money to get high. Raddy Nesbeth was more in control of himself even though he drank too much and liked his cocaine. It's Roddy, you have to meet, Brambles said one afternoon. We were sitting on his porch while Ricky and Natalie did their housework, but Natalie was in a playful mood and we were laughing as she tried to style my hair, even though it was too short to even comb. But we better find him soon, Brambles mused. He goes back and forth to Brooklyn, his brothers juggling, juggling coke up there. We found Raddy a few days later, perched on a stool in his favorite rum shop. I was tongue-tied with him at first and couldn't think of anything to say except that I felt like I had met him already. In the Gleaner's story about the Green Bay inquest, at which he was a star witness, a reporter had described him as a slender, light-skinned man wearing abundant dreadlocks. The description still fits, although his locks had been trimmed a long time ago. No description could have been prepared for prepared me for the rum blared faraway look in Rodney's eyes. He spoke softly, and it was impossible for me to hear him about the throb of the rum shop jute box. We can't reason here, he said. Too much ears around this place. Let's go breeze out on the road. We got into my car and headed out along the Palisades towards Port Royal, a good place for a reasoning about piracy and politics. The afternoon sun blazed over the narrow road, making it shinier, and a hot wind carried the smell of sea, sea rock from the open water. When we reached the town, Roddy wanted to chill out with some ganja, so we brought a little twist of brown paper wrapped herb from a fisherman behind the police station. Roddy squatted 
on the black sand squinting into the harsh sunlight and looking around the harbor to the city while he rolled his spliff then he was ready to reason we went to a sidewalk bar where a gigantic land crab materialized and started clawing its way up my skirt when i freed it gingerly without shrieking Roddy flashed me a wide approving grin daughter level he said to brambles she cool so I just asked him to remember Green Bay and he put the details together in pieces like he was assembling a jigsaw puzzle. Most of we was Rasta, you know, not labor rights. That was the thing. We had influence with the youth and youth in our area, but we was never really on the political side of things. We was independent like free agents and nobody could have really and truly controlled we. We wasn't in nobody's pocket and we would take money from others, eat from either side. Brambles smiled at me across the table and raised an eyebrow. He always said that men like Roddy was nothing like lumpen capitalists, meaning they were about as far from a political vanguard as anyone could be. Their lives had taught them that loyalty to any politician was pure folly and anyone could buy them. So there was the housing scheme going on. Radig went on. And you know, that was the only work theory we have in the area at that time. So when Juno Soul start come round saying there was some boss man going to give we guns and money to guard the site, we jump up. But didn't you think it sounded suspicious? I asked. Sis, Radig answered, his fierce a weary mask. It was the Christmas and all away of a baby mother and them asking for thing and thing. Plus, the army business was a draw. We see some soldier boys start patrolling south side and them deal, them deal with we on a level, not like the cops. The finger not so fast on the trigger. So when June I tell I is the army, he my work for it's some kind of martial and militant. I like that. See, so you see the man just described the same desperation. Same level of force, forged desperation with the people, you know. Make you make some irrational decision. Even when you know so this sound too good to be true, it's like you rather know so. It's like you can't sit down with yourself knowing so well then a possible opportunity went by and you know. So I grab it with both and regardless of how ridiculous it sounds, you know, see, you know, see, but to this day, I don't know what saved me, why, why I dropped down in the sand before the guns opened up. I guess I was in a tactical frame of mind, and when the soldiers told us to bunch up by those targets, Something told me to stand oblique, like never to hand it to them. Hand what to them, I asked. Myself, sis, rather smile. I had been out to Green Bay several times by then to walk around the cove, and I tried to crawl through the Macathon bushes. They look exactly like the crown of thorns on Christ's head. The sandy part of the cove is small, the rest is jagged limestone, and Ruddy had been barefoot, wearing nothing but a shirt and trousers. When his girlfriend found him later at Sister Benedict's, she worked for hours to pick the thorns out of his skin. <laughs> when did you know you weren't going to die? I asked. I never began to feel myself bleed again till I knew I was off that army land. There was helicopter flying above and the soldier, the sound of soldiers shouting from the range. And I knew that if, if, if any of them found me in the Maka, I would be in dead for true. I saw Ruddy's survival as a miracle. But to him, it was all in the day's work. He had been shot at so many times that escape, escaping from an army eradication squad was just another adventure. He recounted the rest of that morning with a sang fried that had a certain cinematic flourish. He crept 
he crept low through the thorns until he came out onto the drift the dirt road that bordered a sugar estate luckily the cane was at its highest ready for the winter harvest so ruddy was able to hide from the helicopter among the spiky stacks he was so drenched with sweat by the time he staggered out from the cane that a young man standing by the road asked him if he had come from the sea ruddy told him he'd come through the swamp and there was no more question they walked together to a country shop where Ruddy got a steady, steadying draft ganja. Then he caught a bus back to, to New Kingston and went down to Last Street in a taxi. I suppose I am supposed to be a dead man by then, he said. But the dopey really. It's true I cast a whole part if I'm busting with him. Come here, try to read straight English, but she intertwine it with what she think is patwa and the way she thinks patwa spells so. It, it you know it it a catch me off guard even when I know patwa sometimes I have to at some new word a French word and them weird about me you know me I say kind of a weird cause I know some know patwa spell anyway I supposed to be you see I supposed to be a dead man kind of talk so. I was supposed to be a dead man by then he said but the dopey go home in style he laughed and then got serious again if sister Benedict had not taken me in, we all would have been dead for true, he said. News of the massacre spread through Kingston's ghettos by the end of the day, sparking a sudden reckoning throughout the gang underworld. It was the outlaws endgame with the politicians, and everyone from Claudia Massop and Bayern Mitchell to Tony Welch and Bucky Marshall knew that a line had been crossed. It had been one thing to war with one another over scarce scraps from the boss's table and to take one another's lives in a struggle that had come to resemble some terrifying kind of blood sport. But now they saw how expendable their lives really were. Slowly a gang truce began to take shape in the tribalized ghettos of Kingston. Beginning on the night of January 5th, the men from Tivoli Garden, Rima, Concrete Jungle and Tel Aviv began crossing no man's land that divided them smoking chalice full of ganja and talking peace if you had been there you might have said it was a miracle ready remember everyone tony welch and the junglists claudia massa buckets crew from matters lane the south is massive all start click chalice pipe together we keep dancing each other's area meet up at national heroes circle and down a parade it was like we rose up as one and just say no more war we black sufferers say we not going to kill one another again so that politician can stay on top. No man, things going to change up now. I remember the remark that Bucky Marshall had made to a Glena reporter as the peace movement spread. This is not political, the outlaw said. This is from we who have felt the pangs of jail. A few journalists like Carl Stone were regular at rum shops downtown, but many had never before been in the ghettos. Once they heard the eloquence of the streets, they started putting the sufferers' words into point, into print. Let us not sentimentalize them, wrote the gleaners John Hearn. Those that I met were not asking for instant love or trust. They were simply demanding that young black people with few jobs stop killing other young black people with fewer jobs in the name of the two parties whose chief executives look after each other very well when it came to the matter of hand handling handing out well-paid jobs every one of them knows that the five men killed at green bay were set up for the killing because they were more useful dead than alive. Neville Toyoi, a radical journalist with the pro Manly Daily News, put the truth in simple terms. The youths have made it plain that they will not be turning against one another for a political for a politician. They are tired of being used. Key, as they see it, is unity. For it is they who have suffered and died. Even Claude Massop was ready to put down his guns. The peace will have to rest, he said. The peace will have to last, he said, because our lives depend on it. The youths, the youths have been fighting among themselves for too long. 
and it's only them get dead. Everybody I go up with is dead. Brambles had taken a slew of photographs during their first euphoric days of the truce. The night after we talked to Roddy in his bed, he dug through the cardboard barrel where he kept his ar archival stash and pulled out photos full of true shots. In one, Claude must have had his arm around Bucky Marshall and both men were engulfed by a throng of ecstatic sufferers. Bucky wore his usual knitted tam and mugged like a clown, but Claude, his neck encircled by a silver torque, emanating the dignity of a chieftain. Manly and Siaga kept their distance from the truce. It caught Siaga by surprise. He was in Miami when it started, meaning with high ups from his party who had gone into exile and were plotting their return. It was said that he was also parlaying with anti Castro Cubans in Miami. He supplied some of the JLP's guns. Meanwhile, in Kingston, the Jamaica Council for Human Rights and the city churches were getting involved in the peace movement, setting up a church advisory committee. Manly made a tentative effort by meeting with its representatives, as did several delegates from the JLP, but Siaga never attended any truce meeting with the Prime Minister. He was talking only with his own gunmen in Tivoli. In the midst of those, these negotiations, Bob Marley came home. He had left Jamaica more than a year before after the shooting in his uptown yard and had been dividing his time between the United States and England. Claude Massop had caught a plane to London and persuaded his old friend to come back. The truce, leading, the truce leaders were planning a historic peace concert at Kingston's National Stadium and they wanted Bob there as its star. Kingston registered two seismic tremors on the night. He flew in. The One Love Peace concert on April 22 included most of the major reggae artists of the moment, Ras Michael and the Sons of Negus, Jacob Miller, Dennis Brown, Culture and Peter Tosh, who were then beginning to record with Mick Jagger. Jacob Miller did his new song about how Green Bay killings a murder. Peter Tosh lit a spliff on stage and told the crowd, Me done with what? With me don't want peace. Me want equality. I am not a politician. I just suffer the consequences. But the high point of the concert was a moment when Mike Quentin Miley summoned Manley and Siaga on stage, making the leaders class hand above their heads in a promise of no more war. It was the only time during the truce that the two men came face to face and it took everything Marley had to get them together on stage. The Central Peace Council, an organization, organization formed by the sufferers themselves, put pressure on Manley and Siaga to keep the police out of the ghettos. The outlaws knew that, that otherwise the truce laid them wide open to cops who were eager to make a name for themselves by killing one of Kingston's most wanted. The chairman of the Peace Council was an educated, well-spoken Rastafari named Trevor Phillips, and I asked Brambles if he knew where Phillips was. That brother have to leave Kingston in a hurry, he said. Once the peace collapse and the guns start firing again, I don't know where he is now, or if he is even alive. The truce had started to crumble even by the time Marley did the One Love concert. The politician recognized that the peace in the ghetto that threatened the status quo and so they sat back and let the police do their eradication work and on the national political front the timing of the truth could not have been worse. Siag and the JLP were pushing hard for a man to call an early election and although he held off until 1980 the gun fever was already building to a crescendo downtown. The JLP had been spoiling for revenge since 1976 and its partisans were eager to fight. The PNP began digging in for what promised to be a bloody election campaign. Mm -hmm. Dudley Thompson, the Minister of National Security and Justice, disavowed the truth and distanced the PNP from the sufferers who, who had called it repudiating the, rest of the Rastafarian community his party had courted since 1972. He said that Ayman culture did not represent Jamaica. This was also a dig at the Rastafarian youth gunned down at Green Bay. 
No angels died at the Green Bay, Thompson said. I had no apologies for those who shout, who shout about human rights and police brutality. We have a definite challenge to authority in the form of terrorism. He called the gang leaders mad dogs who needed to be destroyed. The first to die was Dennis Kapaba, the ranking from Warikail who had begun hanging out with Claude Massop and the Tivoli Posse, lulled by the gang troops into believing that he could cross the lines between PNP Warikail and GLP West Kingston. He was killed by police at the Caymanas Park race track in May 1978 in an ambush set up by Lester Jim Brown Cope, the up and coming Dan of Tivoli. Brown set Copper up to rob the racetrack office, then tipped off the police. He was already jockeying for a position as Tivoli's next godfather, the enforcer who would control the JLP's ranking for the coming 1980 election. He rise spell, his rise spells Massop's doom. The police executed Claudie in February 1979. He was riding home to Tivoli just before dawn on a Sunday night, returning from a soccer match in Spanish town. Three motorcyclists had a detachment of squad cars trailed the taxi Massop was sharing with two friends from the Peace Council, Peace Council and they stopped it on Marcus Garvey Drive. When they ordered Massop to get out of the car with his hands in the air, he tried to explain that they were coming home from a game and had no guns. The lead cop shouted, kill! Massop had time for only one word, wait! before he was riddled with more than 50 bullets. The taxi driver who ran for his life toward the sea was the only one who survived. In the morgue photograph of his corpse, Massop looked a little like Che Guevara, his dark skin pallid in death. His dark skin pallid in death, or was that meant to be paled in death? Thousands of sufferers lined up to view his body at the funeral home where he lay in state and mourners, many of them women, wept in the street for the gunman they saw as a Robin Hood. One woman remembered the Christmas season a few months before when Massop spent more than $1,000 to buy shoes for her people in Tivoli. The PNP rankings in Concrete Jungle stood at attention as his funeral procession passed by. The Greeners, Wilmot Perking, no admirers of Outlaw, were nevertheless moved to write a eulogy for the slain gunman. Massop is part of the legend of the Wild West. He was by all accounts a pretty rough customer. He faced trial for a murder and for a shooting with intent. But by good fortune, ruthless management, shoddy police work, or the triumph of truth, he was never proven guilty. He survived to become, in tradition of Wyatt Earp, Doc Holliday, and Wild Bill Hickok, a gunslinger putting his sinister skills and reputation at the service of peace. But any hope of peace died with Massa. Jamaica was getting very far, an election that would prove to be the most violent in its history. And a new crop of gunmen was coming up in fight with undeclared civil war. The veterans of the 1970s were either dead or in exile. By a Michael, Massop best friend from Tivoli died. Died soon after Massop's murder from a cocaine induced cerebral hemorrhage. Bucky Marshall fled to Miami, where he started selling ganja and cocaine. He stole a stash from Raka in Esbet, the brother of the Green Bay survivor, who eventually caught up with Marshall in Brooklyn at the Starlight Ballroom and shot him dead. This migration north was a sign of what was to come the first wave in the passing exodus to the united states in my in my in my peregrination with brambles and his friends i was already hearing about notches who were making a name for themselves in the brooklyn and miami one night in central a young man in brand new clothes sauntered up to me and asked if I had heard about a ranking from the neighborhood named Delroy Edwards who was sending back money and guns for his old friends in Southside. 
and everyone was talking about Jim Brown, the man who replaced Claude Massop in Tivoli. His real name was Lester Light Cook, Cook, but no one called him that. He was a big, round-bellied man with a deceptively cheery smile, and he started calling himself Jim Brown after the 1967 epic, The Dirty Dozen, became the movie of the year in Jamaica. The original Jim Brown, one of, one of football's most bruising running backs, starred in the movie. The only African American in a cast that included famous heavies like Charles Branson and Telly Savalas. Jamaican gangsters went crazy for this story about a crew of hardened criminals who were let out of prison to assassinate high ranking Nazis. From then on, Lester Cope became Jim Brown. You now he was running a posse called the Shower. So, so named, so named because it rained down bullets on its victims. But the island was too small to hold him. By then, he was shuttling between Jamaica, Miami, and New York. And the shower was becoming the mother of all passes in the United States. There's nothing for them here anymore, Brambles said one night as we walked back to Central after the Raytown Street dance. Everyone wants to fashionize up north, get rich in a New York meet and come home big and broad, but maybe they never come home at all, except in a coffin for the dead house, man. You know, see it. DSI, that is an indication of the 70s, the early 80s, you know, see it. Next chapter name, Kingston Farewell. You know, see, but I hope you realize that the chapter I show you how oh, the the organized, the peaceful, the organized Jamaican and the organized get a youth. These are the death at the step of them. And then the dan them start coming now. You understand what I say? That this this um this chapter is the death of true steppers, as you can realize. Seen from a white woman perspective, seen, and then the dan them start coming. So the next chapter named Farewell Kingston, and we are getting at that soon. You know, see, but it's remark, it's it, it's remarkable how how the more things change, the more it remains the same. You know, see, and. It's unfair for us to keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. See? So this book here outlined our history from the 60s or probably earlier come right up. And in terms of politics and social development for people, it come like a two-day right. You see? Majesty, share, like, and subscribe.